Hi there, I'm Zach Buckle with Farm Table West and we are standing in my newest greenhouse that is a geothermal heating and cooling experiment that we've run uh, the past month or so. We spent the entire summer of 2022 building this thing and I'm going to walk you through what we did, why we did it, and what we've learned so far and what we're probably going to learn in the next couple months of goofing around with this whole system. So, um, this project was designed to develop a geothermal heating system or cooling system, depending on how you look at it, um, that would make a high tunnel greenhouse like the one we're standing in stay above freezing in negative 10 degrees in the winter. Um, and the whole idea is to accomplish that with the cost of about 50 to to $100 a month in electricity as opposed to thousands of dollars a month in natural gas or propane. And the data out there on geothermal isn't that much so that's a big reason why we wanted to try it there's a few other people that are doing uh, very sophisticated geothermal systems where you can grow oranges in Nebraska in extreme cold um, but those systems require a greenhouse to be buried about halfway into the ground and not leave you with very much growing space and since I'm a market farmer market gardener uh, I'm trying to grow as much food as possible in a small amount of space. So square footage for growing space is a big deal for me. So I wanted to try and figure out a way to do it for my context. Um, and that was basically a normal above ground high tunnel greenhouse with all the square footage planted. Um, and so we're standing in a 48 foot by 30 foot high tunnel. Um, that's uh, also double layer plastic inflated. So I'll show you that right over here. Um, that's uh, very important when you're heating because it helps insulate the roof. So this is an inflation fan and this is two layers of plastic. The bottom layer is an anti-condensate plastic. The top layer is a woven um, plastic that should last good 20 years um, with this system but with that double layer inflated there's about six to eight inches of air in between the bottom layer and the top layer that helps keep heat in uh, I think it gets you about an R 1.7 um, that's approximate but uh, which isn't very much if you know anything about R values but it's still better than nothing because it doesn't cost very much uh, it's just that small little fan will inflate the whole thing like a balloon and that gets you a really nice um, insulation be uh, benefit and then the end walls are polycarbonate uh, which is about a half inch thick or maybe a quarter inch thick um, plastic with its double layer plastic with air in between that also gets you about an R 1.7 and that stuff's pretty expensive, but um, again, for that insulation value, it's it's hopefully worth it. Um, I've never built one like this before, so it's new for me. I don't exactly have the experience, but it should give you about R1.7. So with all of those factors, um, we have about an R1.7 insulation around the whole greenhouse. Um, the side walls are roll-up sides. Those are single layers, so there's really no insulation there, but all that R1.7 does is just help slow down the heat loss a little bit. It's not really like insulating a house, but it definitely is worth the cost in this situation when we are trying to heat the whole greenhouse. Now, for the geothermal part of this, um, again, we wanted to develop a system that works with a greenhouse like this that's above ground and has a lot of square footage to grow in. So if this system works eventually as well as we hoped it would in the beginning this um, whole footprint here this is nine 
40 foot beds. Uh, if this works like we expected it to, um, a market farmer or gar- a market gardener could grow. Uh, let me think about this here. Nine times 400. What is that? Oh, anywhere from four to six thousand dollars worth of produce in the winter time uh, in this small of a greenhouse. And this is a fairly small one. A lot of people build them bigger. Our, our one next door is 72 feet long, same width. So um, this is eventually going to be the nursery for my farm. So that's why I didn't make it super big. And I wanted to test out this technology on something smaller. So, um, but this is a very profitable system if it works. Um, and I just keep saying if because it's still a little early in the testing prog- uh, phase. But if it works and it keeps that temperature differential of above freezing and negative 10, which in Wyoming we get less than negative 10 quite often, but it's not super often. And if you had to add a little bit of extra propane in those situations, that's a lot cheaper than heating it all the way from negative 20 to 32. You know, from uh, if it was only negative 20 to, uh, or if the geothermal got it up to 20 degrees and negative 20, then you only have to heat an additional 10 degrees in a few situ- in those extreme situations. So then you need a little bit of more of a boost. The bottom line is you're saving a lot of money in heat, and especially in the spring where it's not really going to be getting that cold, but it'll be below freezing plenty often. So having the ability to grow tomatoes early um, that yields you thousands of dollars in extra income that you don't have to spend in heating because I know other farmers around here they'll spend five thousand dollars in heating before the sol- summer solstice just to get tomatoes to market by June so it's very expensive to heat with fossil fuels but with this kind of technology it will cost a couple hundred dollars not a couple thousand so it's a big deal for people who are growing produce for income or even homesteading um, because it kind of allows you to grow a lot more variety than you would be able to without this kind of heating. So to explain a little bit about what we did, um, you'll see behind me we have a manifold above ground with 29 computer fans attached to uh, this four inch diameter um, corrugated drain pipe and this is the cheapest pipe we could find Um, the whole concept with this is pumping air six feet underground where it's a constant roughly 50 degrees year round and then it comes out on the other end so each one of those pipes with the fan on it on this side comes out blows air underground six feet deep the entire length of the greenhouse and it all comes out that end Um, so the air will change from interior temperature to 50 degrees underground as it moves all the way underground. And we did all, we buried all of that back in March of this year um, and then took most of the summer to build the actual greenhouse. And now it's, it's sort of in a prototype form. We still, it's kind of working, but still needs a lot of work to be optimized. But the output is over there. So when the fans are on, the air will be blowing out here. Um, and the whole point of that is uh, we, we want to change the air the entire cubic footage of air in this greenhouse 12 times an hour and that's the whole concept between our strategy um, other geothermal systems don't work like that it'll be um, a lot less air exchange per hour with more uh, with bigger fans and stuff but um, we're trying to figure out the cheapest most cost effective way of doing this because I would like to do this on a couple more greenhouses eventually so it's not just a one-time thing for me hopefully I'll do it again Um, so we wanted to do it uh, as cheaply as possible and the materials for this cost roughly uh, I have to double check and we'll we'll include this data um, in the show notes but I think it's about $5,000, and I think that's including paying somebody to help me dig, which was necessary to get it all done on time. Um, so 
it might be even less than that. So it's roughly between three and five thousand dollars for this whole system. If you were to pay for a natural gas heater, it's easily five thousand dollars right off the get go, and to set up your natural gas, um, it's it's quite expensive. So it's comparable to what you'd pay for a natural gas heater anyway. Um, and so that was another design parameter for us. Um, so each one of these pipes, again, goes six feet deep uh, below ground um, and three feet above ground roughly, and then comes all the way to the other end uh, out here. Now, as you can see, these are uh, not very well organized. It's kind of just laying on the ground right now, which definitely has an effect on how efficient this system works. But we've been rushing this entire job because uh, I was hoping to have some help building it back in May, but that fell through, so we didn't get started building the whole greenhouse until mid-July. So it was a big setback. We're about you know six to eight weeks behind schedule. So haven't had time to optimize this part of it yet, but I'll get to that in a few weeks um, because each one of these bends in the pipe definitely has an effect on how fast the air is turning over. Um, and then another big problem we had was when we buried the pipe, there was about nine of them that we had to fuse together because the pipe wasn't long enough. Um, and we fused it together in a way that doesn't work real well. Um, it basically, we used caulk and a union fitting and it didn't work at all. It kind of broke apart and the, the air is not coming through at all, about nine of the fans. So uh, what we're gonna do in the future is take all of the fans off the pipes that aren't blowing air and then somehow fit them together on pipes that are so that you got two fans running on one pipe and that'll get you more air exchange and then we'll also uh, make sure that these are all vertical and probably cut them off about three feet above ground so the air has got as least amount of friction as possible. And hopefully that'll get us closer to our initial goal of changing the air over 12 times an hour. Uh, right now it's only about six. Um, and again, I'm pretty sure we'll be able to fix that. But even so far with, how, with all those setbacks, we've got about 20 fans working. Um, and so far we were able to keep the temperature in here with the, everything closed. It was 83 degrees outside. We kept it to 90 degrees in here. Um, so there is a cooling effect to the geothermal, with, even with, we only had nine fans running at that time. Um, <clears throat> but also we found out that the, the plastic, this particular plastic shades a lot, so that adds to it as well. Um, but there is a cooling effect because it was 105 degrees in the greenhouse next to it without, with all the doors closed. So that's, if you know anything about greenhouses, that's a big deal. Uh, Cause on a normal sunny day, you could get your greenhouse with all the doors closed up to 120 degrees, no problem. Uh, especially in Wyoming when the sun's so intense. So that's a, that's a big positive to the system. And then now since we've gotten 20 fans working, uh, on Monday night, it got down to 26 degrees here and we kept it to about 39 40 degrees in here uh so it was 26 degrees outside and 30 to 39 in here <coughs> and you know again if you if you're growing in wyoming you know that 26 is not that cold at all but it does tell you a little bit about how well the system works um so we won't really know how well this works until it starts getting below zero um that's the way i'm looking at it because uh, the temperature differential is not been cold enough outside to really tell how well. But the real exciting thing for me is the, the winter prospects of this and the heating uh, as prospects of this whole system um, because it just adds so much more value to your greenhouses. A lot of growers aren't using their greenhouse in the winter um, <clears throat> because it's so cold in Wyoming. Um, but with this technology, you can do it and still make money if you're a business, or you could just grow fresh stuff for your family if um, <clears throat> if that's what your goal is. Are and this hopefully uh, once we kind of learn more about how it all works, um, which is going to take a while. It's, it's going to take this whole winter pretty much. Uh, once we learn more about that, 
hopefully this system can be tweaked uh, to other greenhouse sizes, at least smaller ones. I don't, I'm not sure about bigger ones, but um, a couple more specifics on uh, the actual pipe layout and everything. Um, we tried, you'll see they're kind of laid out, oh, roughly six inches to a foot apart. Um, we tried to do the best we could when we were burying the pipe to keep them about six inches apart. Uh, it was really difficult though because the pipe is very wiry and, and kind of wants to bend wherever it wants. So what we ended up doing was just standing in between each pipe and then putting a little bit of dirt to spread it out because the pipe uh, will change the temperature of the ground around it as you move air through it. Um, so that was definitely not optimized either. So the what you call the the climate battery underground where the pipes all laid out and buried is kind of uneven in this particular version and that was we've never done this before so there was a learning curve there uh, next time what I do is definitely get some kind of way to spread the pipes out with stakes or something um, although it adds a lot of work to the job because we got the whole thing buried in three days um, it would take a lot more time to put stakes in there so anyway we're still figuring stuff like that out um, that's why this is kind of the prototype version um, but so far, the results have been positive. Um, not exactly what we hoped for, but I think with um, a little bit of tweaking, um, like I said, retrofitting the fans to the pipes that are pumping air and straightening out those pipes over there, I think we could probably get close to 80 to 90% of what we were hoping for in the beginning in terms of the air exchange. And that'll tell you a lot about how well this works and you know, if you wanted to try doing this, you could easily improve on all the mistakes that we made. Um, one other thing with the fusing of pipes, if you, usually when you buy this pipe, um, it comes in a, I think it was a 26, no, no, no. Oh, I can't remember how long. I think they're 500 foot rolls. And so you have to buy them in 500 foot rolls. So there was, you know, I think our length was... I forgot how it all worked, but in order to get 29 separate pipe lengths of pipe, um, we had to fuse nine of them together, and I forgot exactly why that is, but we had to fuse nine of them together because we didn't have, nine of them weren't long enough to get nine feet above ground here and nine feet on the other side, and then the 48 feet footprint of the greenhouse. So we had to use these kinds of union things right here, uh, but what I used was caulk to actually seal them and that just didn't work. We found this black tape which we can put a link to or help you find it. Um, I forgot what it's called but um, a local supplier suggested that and that works great. That actually does the job of fusing together if you do have to do that which you probably will uh, depending on the size of your greenhouse but um, the fusing is you know you have to have one continuous length all the way over there for this to work anywhere close to what you want and obviously we screwed that up but uh, I, I, I think we could fix it um, fairly well enough to prove whether or not this is worth trying again um, and uh, yeah definitely try and make sure that your pipe is a continuous length and then the other big hurdle is building the greenhouse which is totally separate to the geothermal thing, but uh, definitely if you are a business farm, uh, a market gardener, try and do it in the shoulder seasons. Don't do it in the growing season because it's really exhausting. That's what my big uh, stress ball was this season. Um, I was working on weekends a lot to get it done, and it's hard to find help in the middle of the season, get that all organized at the beginning of the season. Um, if you're just a homesteader, then it's probably not as big a deal for you, but... Um, it is nicer to work when it's not 100 degrees. So, because um, this greenhouse took about 120 to 150 man hours to complete. And uh, I have built one once before, so I wasn't totally clueless on that. Um, I was definitely did a better job on this one than the last one I did. But it's a lot of work to build something like this. So, 
def- definitely factor that in. I mean, it's a lot more work to build the greenhouse than it is to do the, the pipe. Um, the geothermal part is just the heating, but the actual greenhouse itself takes a lot of work, um, depending on what you got. So just never underestimate that part. But, you know, once it's done, it's done. And um, hopefully if you're going to try doing this, you can uh, fix, you know, or kind of learn from the mistakes we've made already. Um, and I'll probably do another video like this at some point once we've tweaked everything. And um, probably once it gets cold, um, I'll do another video explaining how this all works. And um, and after we've tweaked everything. But yeah, if you want to try geothermal growing in Wyoming where it gets to negative 20 pretty regularly in the wintertime, um, this is probably worth a shot. You know, it's definitely... There's, there's other versions out there that are that are working, but we wanted to figure out a way to do it in this kind of greenhouse without any extra fancy insulation that you have to put on and off every year because I'm going to have um, three or four more of these in the future, and I know I won't have time to be doing that every single year, putting on styrofoam on the back or something like that. So we wanted to figure out a way to do it with this exact situation and... Um, I think we're warm. We'll see how close we get. But um, if it works, it's kind of a big deal for the rest of uh, the West or the, the northern climates where it gets really, really cold. Um, and when I say negative 20, I mean negative 20 Fahrenheit for anybody who's not in the U.S. Negative 20 Fahrenheit is pretty cold. Um, we're a zone 4B for anybody who knows the plant zones. Um, roughly zone 4B. So, yeah, it gets really, really cold here pretty much every winter. Um, and I've already had some success growing winter crops like spinach, carrots, green onions and stuff with a unheated greenhouse that I have behind me. Um, but I know that it will be, the crops I have here are all less hardy than that. So they're like arugula, um, lots of different salad greens that I know won't survive negative 20, uh, even with extra row cover protection and stuff. And we also have radishes and stuff like that. So I know that if we keep it close to above freezing in here, all of this stuff will survive fairly well and grow back probably fairly decently in the winter. Um, and that's the whole goal here is to try and figure out how to grow uh, more variety of stuff in the winter um, in this extreme climate. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that explanation. If you have any questions... Uh, feel free to email me at zb at farmtablewest.com and I'm sure I'll learn a lot more in the next couple months on how this whole project works. But um, yeah, it's been a fun experience so far and it's going to be a lot cooler once we see it get down to you know below zero temperatures and see how this all works. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching and um, hopefully you'll see me again in some more videos like this. Thanks. Bye.